Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Blueprint for Better Care Quality, How Hartford Healthcare Uses Technology at Scale. On behalf of Beckers, thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we begin, I just want to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation, and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or you have trouble with the audio, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box, as we are also here to help. I am Mackenzie Bean, Managing Editor at Beckers, here to serve as today's moderator. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. John Grady Benson is the Physician-in-Chief of the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford HealthCare, and Mark Lieberman is President of Force Therapeutics. Dr. Grady Benson and Mark, thank you both so much for being here. Really looking forward to this presentation. And with that, I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Grady Benson to get things started. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mackenzie. As uh, Mackenzie said, I'm Dr. John Grady Benson. I'm the physician in chief of uh, the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford HealthCare. I'm also uh, a partner in Orthopedic Associates of Hartford. I want to make it clear to everybody on the webinar first, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, second, I have no conflicts of interest uh, in this webinar, meaning I'm not being paid by Force Therapeutics or by Beckers. I'm here of my own volition, uh, and it's a privilege to, to be here. Now I'll pass it off to Mark. Thank you, Dr. Grady Benson, and thank you, uh, McKinsey. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Uh, I will refer to you as John and uh, look forward to this webinar. Uh, I'm Mark Lieberman, uh, the president and co-founder of Force Therapeutics. I lead our business and strategic development efforts at FORCE, as well as support around quality patient education. So a bit about FORCE. Uh, FORCE Therapeutics is an established and nationally recognized patient engagement platform and research network. Over the last decade, we have successfully partnered with over 70 top health systems and ASCs to deliver a comprehensive and dynamic patient experience platform. From pre-op optimization and injury management to post-op care, FORCE really drives evidence-based best practices for surgeons and their care teams. We're proud that we have treated over 350,000 patients to date and collected millions of data points. This volume of patient data provides us unprecedented insights from a clinical and research perspective. As of this week, uh, we actually published our 100th research study, many topics of which you can only study if you have objective daily patient data. Some of the consistent impacts we've seen across our partners include reducing readmissions and complications, improving operational efficiencies across the entire care team. Patient satisfaction and outcome collection have significantly and consistently improved at all of our partner hospitals. And these factors all contribute to managing down healthcare costs. Most importantly, the model we designed a decade ago is now proven. So digital care is a ubiquitous strategy. We see today that modern health systems are prioritizing now best-in-class digital care by specialty and forced as a solution of choice for the delivery of musculoskeletal care. Uh, thanks, Mark. And again, this is John Grady Benson. Um, so the Bone and Joint Institute at Hartford Hospital is the regional leader in musculoskeletal care, and it's a real privilege that we're the only self-contained hospital uh, that is focused on orthopedics and musculoskeletal uh, care issues uh, in the whole state of Connecticut. So we have an interdisciplinary uh, team that provides orthopedic care soup to nuts, uh, Children's Hospital deals with the pediatric patients, and they're really basically right next door. Um, and we've got care providers who have really had decades of experience providing innovative orthopedic care with a holistic and, and patient-centered approach. That's really the key to our care delivery, and I think that will become clear through the webinar, is how FORCE helps us uh, improve and augment our patient-centered care uh, focus. So uh, the goal at the end of the day 
uh, is every patient every day, right? We want to bring our best selves to our patient care to get them back to the normal activities as quickly, safely, and, and really painlessly as possible. Uh, and we've been able to do this efficiently and effectively uh, by prioritizing the patient experience and making sure uh, that the patient is at the heart of our decisions. So while we have standardized care protocols for thousands of patients in order to be efficient, in order to have data streams that are equitable and realizable, each patient has a different focus for themselves. One patient after joint replacement might want to get into a kayak, another might just want to walk to the store, uh, but, uh, and Force Therapeutics allows us that individuality amongst these thousands of patients. So a big factor uh, in that patient experience is obviously commitment to patient safety and quality outcomes. So we have a massive relational database uh, that we call Galileo, uh, and it's basically a sophisticated database that tracks every procedure, validates the outcomes, adjudicates all of the procedure codes and the diagnostic codes, and then shows us how well people get back to their daily lives uh, and gives us sort of the, uh, the data of truth that we can make informed decisions on, improve quality care, uh, and get better all the time, because that's obviously our goal is getting better all the time. So that validated uh, data uh, is becoming increasingly important uh, in today's healthcare world, right? So healthcare as a business is requiring it. Our noble goal as uh, doctors, surgeons, and providers is, is to provide the best quality care all the time. Uh, and so uh, we're going to use FORCE and show you how FORCE helps us uh, in, in that continuous quality of care improvement agenda. Um, so now we'll speak about the significance of going live uh, with FORCE uh, during the pandemic as well. I'll pass it off to you, Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, let's go to the state of the industry slide. So it's important uh, to state some of the factors uh, that have driven the strategies we're about to discuss and John has uh, highlighted many of these in his conversation. Quality virtual care and clean data are must-haves for elevating your patient experience. Scaling your navigation and care coordination uh, has proven to dri drive significant value, and it's a superior care model. Payers have become savvier than ever about quality impacts, and um, an engaged patient has been shown to be more satisfied, less expensive, and achieves better outcomes. And look, you know, healthcare organizations are just starting to recover from the massive shock to the system in uh, the last year. Every day, uh, we are hearing from our clients and industry leaders that a cohesive and comprehensive digital strategy will build resilience under any scenario for years to come. So virtual care has become ubiquitous. Um, the AHA has estimated that hospitals and health systems suffered $121 billion of financial losses in the last six months of uh, 2020 due to uh, current reductions in patient volumes and a myriad of additional expenses associating with trying to deliver care during a pandemic. Uh, the pandemic triggered a rapid deployment of virtual care to treat a fully remote patient and what we discovered was this newfound openness by a diverse range of patient populations, even our oldest and least tech savvy, uh, it's ushered in a new era of care. Uh, even the crankiest of providers uh, are now on board with using technology as a care pathway. Um, we've had a decade long hypothesis that high technology would become a regular part of patient care. And that has finally been realized. Um, technology has a proven ability in this battleground environment to improve patient care, bring digital coordination, to care team workflows, and you know, all importantly without sacrificing the quality that patients expect. Uh, almost every clinical provider uh, we know needs a better way to communicate with their patients uh, once they leave the four walls of the hospital. So digital infrastructure is what helps them scale that communication and reach patients where they're most comfortable in the last year, most safe. 
as an example for us, uh, last year we saw a 62% increase in the daily logins uh, to our platform and uh, an 87% increase in the viewership of all of our educational content. Uh, what this means is that there's a new modality of clinical care and we've ushered in this exciting new chapter, the modern remote patient. So scalable care does drive value and marketability. And I apologize to Mark, I skipped a bullet point on my one of my last slides there, but that's a perfect segue uh, to discussing how we went live with force in April 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. We had decided at Hartford HealthCare that digital care was necessary and evolving for all of our patients. And then none of us could have predicted the pandemic, but what a time to start, right? When patients can't go into a geographical space to see their provider, but can go on their phone or a mobile app to get uh, care delivered to them. So technology does improve access. In the old days, it was just that you had to be affable, available, and able. Uh, and now, uh, Force Therapeutics allows our patients to have access directly to me or my care team. Uh, and having had that available in the pandemic was just uh, absolutely uh, golden for us. Um, so uh, when done right, these efforts really serve to drive program value and, and market share because now you're more available. Um, it's not enough to simply scale for the sake of increased volume. Programs have to scale intelligently to be set up for success and able to manage the, the subsequent growth. So as all of our time is crunched as providers, we have to expand our teams. And expanding our teams is engaging technology in a smart way, making sure we're measuring outcomes, and making sure that uh, a system like Force allows us to add to the touch points of care, uh, which we'll go uh, into in more depth uh, later. So it's also imperative that uh, you equip uh, all providers to quickly and easily track and address each patient concern. So I can't be on the phone or my secretary can't be on the phone all the time, and that was old school, but now we have algorithmic care uh, right in the patient's hand so that the care is brought to them, questions can be answered in a personalized manner, but also algorithmically for any specific problems. So when these are prioritized and operationalized, programs see better value uh, and outcomes in turn. Uh, and, and that allows us to expand our market share and attract more patients. John, you, you were the captain sailing through the eye of the hurricane going live April 2020. That's incredible. And uh, we look forward to learning all about that experience. So. You know, payers are really seeking proof of engagement, and FORCE has been uniquely leveraged by our provider organizations to, to both demonstrate and distinguish the value that they deliver payers. Um, we often see our digital care platform as part of an overall strategy uh, to capture new patients by elevating quality, distinction, and in some cases, even becoming a center of excellence. Uh, technology has the potential to engage and empower patients anywhere and time, and it makes them active participants in their own continuum of care. It's really an important point. Um, since we've created this transparency around patient engagement through data collection, and it's not just force, it's everyone that's in digital care, uh, payers are now asking for it. And soon we will hear that they will be requiring uh, that transparency. Uh, today, uh, Force is a preferred vendor with some of the largest payer groups in the country. Uh, and one of the first questions we always get asked are, what are your engagement rates? Uh, what are your outcome results? How does that compare against uh, baseline data? How many patients are you actually capturing of a total uh, case volume of a surgeon and how are they faring? These are very sophisticated questions that we're getting from payers that we did not get two years ago. And you need to have good answers to these questions. Um, so for force, um, what we've seen across uh, all of our patient populations is that we're able to get 89% uh, pre-op uh, pros compliance. And at one year, uh, we're able to get 77% pros compliance um, because we've established a relationship with that patient and it continues after they recovered. Um, 
we have seen a decrease in post-op utilization by 20% or more, and an increase in procedure satisfaction by 20% or more. Um, our platform captures pros at such a high collection rate that has become a sort of surprise value asset for our healthcare partners. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, United Healthcare now requires uh, a completed pre-op who's and who's form in order to obtain uh, pre-authorization for surgery. So many are scrambling to find solutions to deliver that information uh, to authorize the surgery. Um, when it comes to satisfying all of these demands comprehensively and effectively, innovative programs like Hartford are already set up for success. So the hard work that you did in the eye of the storm, you know, I think really sets up for a great future. And this modern approach to care is in demand by both payers and patients alike. So in the next slide, we'll visualize how we engage with patients and their care teams uh, across an episode of care. Um, we've learned a lot uh, from our experience uh, that successful recovery really starts with preoperative optimization. As soon as a surgery is scheduled, forces engage with the patient to ensure that they're set up for success or for their long journey ahead. And the force optimization uh, begins with alerts uh, back to the care team in real time. If the patient is showing that they're at risk, if they're getting off track, uh, or if they're really not ready for surgery, that's an important indicator to get back to the care team. Um, Video-based education, virtual joint class, pre-op exercises, two-way communication, creating these baseline pros that we've been talking about all begins well prior to surgery. And as we uh, just mentioned earlier, you know, the baseline pros are now required by uh, a number of the payers. But pre-op pros collection really serves another important purpose. It's this engaged patient. Um, you know, you provide the data to the patient on where they are and where they need to be, and it activates them in the care from the get-go. It is sort of the starting line of their journey. Our research shows uh, that setting patient expectations has been positively correlated to high levels of patient satisfaction and functional outcomes. And look for the hospital, optimizing that patient preoperatively uh, absolutely reduces surgery cancellations, uh, reduces complications, and these are very expensive mistakes that you want to avoid, particularly in a value-based uh, economic model. A digital 24-7 connection also establishes that the care team is, is the single source of truth. Um, you know, FORCE continuously reiterates this point to patients, starting with the surgeon video that, uh, that opens that relationship. You know, you go to FORCE, not to Dr. Google for your questions. Care instructions that are prescribed by your physician reside in FORCE, and your answers uh, are prescribed specifically to you. And what this does is it really avoids the common fragmentation of information that we see and worse, the patient gets wrong, wrong care instructions. Um, so we believe care coordination is critical and has historically been challenging with the paper-based models uh, within a traditional patient experience. John? So yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, so any conversation around technology uh, in healthcare also has to address whatever electronic medical record you're using uh, and the, the whole virtual ecosystem that already exists in any healthcare system. So at Bone and Joint Institute, we do 5,500 to 6,000 cases a year. We rely on the EMR to give us some data, but we can't rely just on that, and we can't rely on the all claims database. We can't rely just on data from CMS, right? So we have to adjudicate that data, report it transparently within ourselves as our own quality care control, and then we absolutely have to uh, partner with some technology partner, and, and we strongly have chosen FORCE because we know that the FORCE will give us benchmarking data that we can really understand what we're doing. So Mark mentioned patient-reported outcomes. For all of their inefficiencies, PROs are here with us to stay. They allow us to measure what we think is unmeasurable. So I'm a joint replacement surgeon. It, it's no longer good enough to say, hey, I do X number of joint replacements a year and all my patients do well. We really have to prove that. And so FORCE gives us the platform to focus on those core comp competencies. 
We measure patient-reported outcomes in every single service line. Right now in force, we're using joint replacement and spine as our programs, but we plan to expand that into the trauma world also. And this becomes a differentiator for our program. Right, so uh, it allows us not only to get better at what we do because that's what we need to do and want to do, but it also allows us tools to be a competitor in the marketplace. So it improves the patient experience with patient access. We have benchmarking data upon which we can do research and get better all the time. Uh, and it's part of the value-based care agenda, right? And that, that term gets thrown around rather loosely these days, value-based care. But what we really mean, you know, based on the Michael Porter's definition, is outcomes that matter most to patients at the most affordable cost. So we're committed to improving uh, that value equation, uh, and FORCE uh, really helps us uh, on that journey. So we've, we've found that uh, by acknowledging and prioritizing the patient journey across the continuum of care for whichever uh, episode of care we're dealing with, uh, force allows us to improve quality of care and, as Mark said, decrease costs in turn. There's a, no question there is a decrease in postoperative utilization uh, and there's tremendous cost to be saved in that regard. And we'll talk about that further in the webinar. So in the next three slides, uh, we'll discuss how you can execute on a unique patient journey uh, by levering, leveraging technology in these three ways. Personalized patient care at scale, scale digital navigation capabilities uh, and care coordination, and attract pairs with superior patient engagement uh, and outcomes. Thanks so much, John. Um, and look forward to talking more about how benchmarking is going to drive the future of your business. Um, so it was a hard year for the in-office patient journey. Uh, the call to the patient at a few designated times, seeing the patient once or twice for follow-up visits really got turned on its head in 2020. And there've always been limitations to this traditional patient uh, journey, but they were absolutely exacerbated uh, when in-person care was largely removed for safety reasons. We discovered uh, that a couple of touch points are really insufficient to provide the visibility that you need into the patient's care in the home and how they're responding to daily treatment. And without a connection, we also find that the patient is really less engaged in their care, and the care team doesn't have the insight into what the patient is doing. And there's this potential for, I wish I had known that weeks ago. And that is uh, really what we hope that force and technology solves. So force was built for the patient um, to digitally wrap our arms around them throughout their care. Uh, all of our product innovations serve to address the uniqueness of our patient population. We, we don't just want to engage a patient. We want to empower them. We want to delight them. And we want to give them knowledge that's incredibly valuable and personal and timely. Throughout their continuum of care, our patients are hyper-engaged with their physician and care team with countless automatic touch points. And with every reminder we give them, and there are many here, we reinforce that their care is being personally prescribed by their surgeon and their care team, which just makes a world of difference. Uh, John alluded earlier to the concept of standardization, but equally important personalization, and that is what force really uniquely allows um, when it comes to engagement and creating positive outcomes. The, uh, the force episode of care is a dramatically improved experience for the patient, and we know this now, having treated and studied uh, over hundreds of thousands of patients across all populations and demographics on our platform. What we know is that the patient wants to be digitally connected. And it's become a competitive advantage for any hospital who chooses to deliver care this way. Uh, we recently released uh, our Intelligent Care Plan product. And within this, a patient's plan of care automatically adapts and learns in real time on how the patient is responding to questions and how they're progressing with their own recovery. They're a smoker or their BNI is a certain level the system changes to accommodate them. Um, again, 
we believe personalization is key. And every part of the platform and the patient experience was built uh, with this in mind, and it really wasn't the way that the EMR was ever intended uh, or built to do, as John uh, discussed earlier. Thanks, Mark. So, we, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, developing and building successful teams, and all of us have done that uh, in traditional medicine. And, you know, providing patients with appropriate system and tools to ensure that they're safe and that uh, they've got the best care delivered to them as possible. Um, so if you look at those two last slides that Mark had, you know, traditional models are, are manual and time intensive, right? It requires that the patient waits in a geographical space. They have to pick up the phone. They have to wait for my secretary to answer. She's, she or he has to give the message to me or to my care team. We have to get back to them. Uh, and so that's not necessarily real time. It's all about waiting. Um, and what the force therapeutics tool gives people is all that power uh, in their hands. So it engages them in the process. They feel more cared for. They have availability to real live human beings, but they also have availability to education, physical therapy programs, videos. You can customize questions that patients need for your own personal practice. Um, and so all of that um, is is quality care, and that's basically what digital navigation is. It unloads the navigator's burden, augments their duties, giving back invaluable time to focus on delivering the best care possible. So when uh, our teams first started with FORCE, some of the pushback from our uh, medical executive assistants was, well, I'd just rather use the phone, because that's what they're used to. And change can be difficult, but FORCE really makes it easy. And we have definitely found that we are saving FTEs, not adding more when we leverage the power that force can have in terms of getting the data into the patient's hands, as Mark said, in real time. That, and that's the key, in real time. So those touch points of care uh, become more useful to patients uh, when they have control, when they can pick up their phone, ask a question, get answered in a reasonable time, or find the information they need without having to wait on the phone. Um, so scalable navigation should be a cornerstone, I believe, and I think everyone would agree with this, in, in the patient engagement strategy. Right? It's, a, it's a critical component when it comes to creating a superior patient experience and freeing up FTEs, as we talked about. Uh, the coordination capabilities in force go beyond just communication. Uh, nurses and providers can plan their outreach with individual patients based on compliance, whether they filled out specific PRO forms, uh, and even at risk level, right? So if you identify a high-risk patient, you know that you're going to have to have more touch points of care with that patient without having them to come uh, into a geographical space in the office in order to do that. So you know, we, we really pride ourselves at BGI on, on giving patients and providers access to this leading-edge technology uh, to ensure that the highest quality of care and outcomes are achieved. And um, we're able to achieve excellence by continually recognizing, uh, being recognized by leading accreditation bodies. I mean, we've got all the STAR certifications and, and always want to get better and better beyond that. We're not just there to get the grade. We're there to have the patient experience tell us, hey, this is the best place I've been. I would send my family here. This was a great experience. And FORCE really does uh, augment that for us. It plays a big role uh, in the patient experience. We have an outstanding team of real uh, nurse navigators and nurse coordinators uh, that are part of our care team. Um, and, and it's hyper-focused on that concept, right? Every patient every day, uh, that, that's our phrase. Every patient every day, no such thing as a silly question, uh, and always, always uh, ask, and we will try to answer in a timely fashion, and, and FORCE just enables all of that. Um, so it, it really does you know, build deeper connections. Um, if we look at um, traditional models uh, compared to uh, to where we've been in the past, you know, patient reported outcomes are here to stay. Uh, so payers and employers are really becoming much more savvy than ever before when it comes to patient engagement, and they finally realize that there are metrics that we can use to to manage our quality. 
And again, it's not just about volume. It's about the quality we deliver and proving it. Measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not so, a fa famous phrase from Galileo. And so how we do that, we, we use patient reported outcomes as one aspect of all the data that we collect. So here's just an initial screenshot of some of our preliminary data when we started uh, back in April of how our uh, patient reported outcomes for hips and knees, HOOS and COOS scores. For those of you who are not familiar, the HOOS score is the Hip Osteoarthritis Outcomes Survey. So these are validated tools that measure pain and function prior to surgery and after surgery at different time points. And so we want to make sure that we benchmark uh, internally, myself against other joint replacement physicians, for instance. We want to benchmark against other hospitals. We want to benchmark nationally and internationally, and FORCE has a massive database where we can work in tandem uh, to ensure that we're making the right decisions on the people we operate on uh, and that they're getting better as we expect them uh, to. So FORCE really uh, helps us validate the work we've done. It validates the data. Uh, and then you know, how you visualize this is ex extremely important. So there are executive dashboards uh, I can make my dashboard slightly different than someone else's, or the spine team can have a dashboard that they like to see things differently uh, than the joint replacement team, for instance. Uh, so this is customizable with outcome scores, and then you can add it to other compliance data uh, that we do in our, our, again, our relational database called, called Galileo. So this really does allow us to monitor uh, things on a, on a daily basis per service line. So if you look at this uh, data collection process, and Mark alluded to this in one of the previous slides of all those touch points of care, uh, what we do uh, is um, before the uh, patient has their surgery, obviously when they're booked for surgery, that's when FORCE uh, sends them uh, via email uh, an invitation to invite. And all it takes in my office is to say FORCE Therapeutics is going to send you a very important survey, and it's also a tool for education, preparedness, and helps me help you navigate through the episode of care. And that's really all I have to say, and I hand them a small pamphlet on force. You know, people worry about the time it takes to get things going. It really doesn't take much time. So once that uh, engagement occurs, we send them to our PREPARE program. PREPARE is an acronym. It, it stands for Procedure Related Education and Pre-Anesthesia Risk Evaluation. So all of our elective surgical patients go through PREPARE. Uh, whether or not they see their primary care uh, physician, they all go to PREPARE, and that is our data entry point, right? So that's where we adjudicate the data, have all sorts of risk stratification scores, uh, and in the meantime, for therapeutics, uh, is uh, ongoing. So patients see a video of me introducing the program, telling them I'm going to take good care of them as best as I possibly can, uh, and then can you please fill out these important surveys where we get their patient reported outcomes. Then the surgical episode happens, and after that, we start to capture uh, post-operative patient reported outcomes. Uh, we, uh, I won't go through this whole algorithm of uh, care, but we have a HEAL program for people in recovery. Uh, all of their health is optimized prior to the operation, and then we follow up again based on our risk stratification tools uh, to try to predictively engage the patients who are more in need than other patients and follow them through the process. And then FORCE basically helps us all along the way with those uh, communication tools. John, thank you so much. So inspiring and amazing how much you have accomplished since April uh, 2020. Uh, we look forward to a very long uh, relationship together. And um, I'm going to wrap this up, and then we'll open for questions. And as John said, uh, no question is silly. So look, in, in 2021, we are seeing uh, major tailwinds uh, drive further adoption of healthcare technology. Systems want best-in-class digital tools by specialty. The personalization and expertise required is significant, and systems are looking for tools uh, with a proven track record so that they can feel confident to replace traditional care with hybrid or fully remote digital care. 
And uh, we're seeing a lot of activity uh, for solutions in mental health, in cancer, in OB, and, uh, and of course, in MSK. Generalized healthcare tools are just uh, not cutting it because of the specialization, personalization demands. The next big hurdle uh, for the years ahead is uh, equality and trying to bring uh, equitable access to care. So why should your geography determine the quality of care uh, that you as a patient would receive? Um, we believe that digital solutions will extend the best providers throughout their region. And one day, we are going to see national delivery models built on a digital infrastructure. Telemed is just V1 of this evolution. And then finally, uh, new insurance requirements uh, are creating new innovation because the dollars do follow um, the innovation. Um, for example, we discussed earlier that PROMS data is now being required for insurance preauthorizations. Um, that's one of many examples that we are hearing about in 2021. And the more that we see the payers and the blues reimburse for proven digital care, the faster we will all innovate how these digital tools are adopted. In our opinion, we must remove the cost decision barrier for providers. So just to conclude, here are some must-haves um, that both John and I have talked about. Uh, quality and reliable daily patient data. Properly educating and informing your patients wherever they are frequently and when they need it. Scaling your care coordination uh, while maintaining a personalized care model. Making sure you've got a cohesive digital care strategy to handle any systemic change or care setting that comes uh, your way. And certainly in 2020, that systemic change was significant. Same day, all virtual, surgery dates, delays. Each of these needs a strategy and a system that can manage that patient regardless of the storm. And finally, a digital system uh, must be comprehensive and must innovate ahead of your evolving needs. So with that, um, I will turn it back to our moderator. And uh, John, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned so much, and uh, I hope our audience has as well. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Well, We're certainly ready for questions. Perfect. We've already had a lot of good questions rolling in. Um, and thank you both, Dr. Grady Benson and Mark, um, for such an important, important presentation. I feel like we have all learned a lot already. Um, if you still have questions you'd like to ask Dr. Grady Benson or Mark, please submit those now by typing them into the Q&A chat box you see on your webinar console, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for. The first question is, can you describe the force technology? Is it integrated with the EMR? So uh, FORCE is integrated uh, with the EMR in many of our uh, partner organizations, um, but we have in many cases begun uh, independent of the EMR. We have a team uh, that actually makes it quite easy to integrate, and those integration levels can be um, simple ADT feeds so that we get, uh, as John was saying, the day of surgery scheduled, uh, we are uh, deploying force and making that automated to deeper integrations where there's two-way integration, single sign-on, um, being able to be interoperable, being able to move uh, the record where we're the system of engagement back to the system of record, which is the EMR, is a very important part of our strategy. And it's uh, something that uh, you know we've been able to accomplish and, most of our organizations that want it and all of them that uh, that will in the future. And Mark, this is John. I, uh, I just want to augment what, and, uh, what you said. So we started out at Bone and Joint Institute um, with FORCE as an outside uh, platform, collecting all the data, working out any bugs, getting our teams engaged. But it is extraordinarily important to take that data and integrate it into the EMR. And FORCE has done this numerous times and really makes it quite easy. So what that allows us then is to gather all of our comorbidity data on patients, for instance, 
and then match that with our patient reported outcomes and and all sorts of other data, how much pain people had, how many times they engaged in the platform, how many times we had to communicate with them. And if you think about that, if you have adjudicated data in your uh, EMR, and we're doing that independently in our Galileo database, and then you match that with force, it gives you a powerful tool to look at, okay, what are the specific things that cause an adverse event? What are the things that we can do to prevent a readmission? How can we decrease our uh, emergency room visits? What can we do to decrease the post-acute spend in physical therapy and use force, and how effective is that? So if you think about all those, that data strategy, then what it allows you is predictive analytics. So if Mrs. Jones comes for uh, her joint replacement, and I know everything about her in terms of her body mass index, her activities, uh, and all those other factors, and I match that with the artificial intelligence that we learn over time, then we can predict for Mrs. Jones, you're starting out with a WHO score of X. I predict that you're going to be you know, 90% predictive value. You're going to have a WHO score of Y, and that this is what we need to do specifically for you to get in your kayak and be happy with your hip replacement. And FORCE just allows that to happen. So when you integrate the FORCE platform with the data you have in your EMR, it's a hugely powerful predictive analytic tool. Great, thank you both for weighing in there. Really appreciate it. The next question is, what type of injuries do you find FORCE is more suitable for? Do you want to take that mark? I mean, right now at Bone and Joint, we're using force for spine surgeries and joint replacement, and we're going to move it into the trauma space. So I would be a novice uh, in answering that specific question, but I'm confident that uh, for trauma patients, we'll be able to, uh, over time, uh, again, provide digital connections. So just think about somebody with an ankle fracture. They've got a, they've got a question about how swollen they are, how much pain they have and you've got uh, tools to help them answer those questions, and you're able to you know, not have to have them come into the office to be seen, uh, they can send a picture of their ankle and send it to you on the force platform, and, we, and the team can answer them back. Uh, we can manage their pain, and over time, you'll have more tools to say, okay, over the last 1,000 ankle fractures that we've treated, here's where you are in your recovery uh, pattern. Uh, so it, it really does become a personalized approach. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you have any more specific things to, to talk about in your trauma trauma program. Sure. I mean, you know, our strategy is anywhere that a patient will benefit from uh, remote education, uh, communication, data analytics, uh, connective tissue back to the care team, we want to be of value to them. And so we are broadly across all uh, MSK procedures, um, you know, as John mentioned, we're in total joints, uh, total hip, uh, shoulder. Um, we have a, a large initiative in the non-operative uh, space right now, uh, minor injuries, lower back, osteoarthritis, you know, any of these areas where uh, a patient uh, wants to be able to take control of their own recovery and care whether it's uh, minor or major, uh, we believe that force is of value. And a lot of that gets dictated, frankly, in terms of sequence by the care teams and the hospital. And so, as John said, we started with total joint. Um, as the organization becomes more comfortable and confident that they have proof within their patient population that this is working uh, at or above what they had expected it to, they start to broaden uh, the the use cases and uh and so you know our hope uh with with hartford is that there will not be a patient that we cannot take care of jointly with them in years to come got it i think that's helpful for our audience to know so appreciate you both weighing in there another audience member is asking did sports help with joint commission certification for total joint advanced accreditation a uh, great question if you don't uh, mind me taking that mark, Ben, and certainly you can augment. So the the, the answer is absolutely yes uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, FORCE is our platform for sending all of the patient-reported outcome reports to the American Joint Replacement Registry and the American Spine Registry, right? 
So in addition to education, communication, access to care, we're using the FORCE platform uh, in, a, in an easy and facile way uh, to send all of our outcomes to those agencies, AJRR and, a, and uh, ASR. And by doing so, that is an absolute key uh, to being um, joint, uh, to get joint commission uh, certification for, adva for advanced accreditation. Yeah, thanks, Sean. You know, I would add to that that uh, a number of our uh, hospitals have leveraged force uh, for uh, joint accreditation, and uh, it's been uh, something that the uh, commission looks for. Uh, the data obviously enables them to do a better job of evaluating uh, how the organization is delivering care. Uh, and it's something that we have a lot of experience doing, and so we try to be consultative uh, to our organizations to set them up for success. Very important. And again, just as I've thought about it more, Mark, the other thing that, that FORCE allows, again, is, is benchmarking. And so what the Joint Commission wants to see is that not only are you internally getting better all the time, but you're benchmarking yourself against other organizations. So at every service line meeting at the Bone and Joint Institute, we have every surgeon's name, right, transparent data mm. amalgamation. And so I know exactly how I am performing against all of my partners, not in a blame and shame way, but in a collaborative way. And when we look at the data in that realm, right, in a milieu of how are we all going to get better, not I'm better than you or you're not better than me, right, but how are we all going to get better? And you add all the patient-reported outcomes data and you add the patient experience data that we're measuring and use force to help with that process, it's an amazingly powerful tool. It helps us all collaborate, and that's what the Joint Commission wants to see. Not only that's, and we don't do it because the Joint Commission wants to see it, we do it because it gets us all better, right? Um, but, it, but it does relate to the Joint Commission certification for, for advanced accreditation in both spine and uh, total joint. John, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Because I think it's fascinating when we think about benchmarking and where that takes us as an industry three years, five years from now. Do you see a day where that benchmarking data, you know, at your hospital for your surgeons becomes publicly available and becomes something that patients and payers start to use as they're making decisions around where they're going to have their care delivered? Absolutely. And, it, you know, and it's happening now and it hasn't happened soon enough. I mean, you can go to your car dealer, right, and find out more about your car online before you buy that vehicle than you can about going to John Grady Benson for a joint replacement or to what hospital you're going to go to. So we actually proudly want to uh, transparently have that data available, right? I mean, that's what patients deserve. And we only get better when we embrace the things that didn't go as well as we expected despite every possible precaution, right? And so internally, we're looking at all that data transparently. What we absolutely want to magnify and make public is these are our outcomes. This is what our infection rate is. These are how many people got blood clots. These are how many people were readmitted to the hospital. These are how many cases we do. All right, we only get better when we, when we talk about it, uh, when we engage patients in that process, when we help patients say, you will really be helping every other person when you fill out your survey form on force. All right, you're, you're not only helping us, you're helping yourself, you're helping uh, other people as we get better all the time. And so I, I think that has to be part of the algorithm to get better. I mean, the ancient days of hospitals were, you know, don't report what, what happened that went wrong, right? The, the, the sort of fear-based um, healthcare delivery system. We have to move away from fear-based to this is what actually happened, this is why, and this is what we did to make it better. And I, and I think the digital tools and all the benchmarking process that are available through them will get us closer and closer to that all the time. This is exactly uh, what, what we're seeing is, you know, as, as organizations are becoming centers of excellence, uh, distinction centers, they're not using benchmarking, as you say, 
to blame or, or drive fault. They're using it as a tool to create continuous improvement. You know, people want to know where they stand, uh, whether they're the patient or a provider or a hospital, and that progress is so important and it's so gratifying. Um, so it's this continuous improvement loop and you can't do it without a baseline and you can't do it without measuring everything all the time. Absolutely, and I think this discussion is a good segue into the next audience question, which is, what was the patient response to having a re remote tool like Forest during the height of the pandemic? Well, we, we found it was just, I mean, amazingly great timing uh, for the Bonner Joint Institute. And again, we, we clearly didn't want the pandemic planet. Um, we were going to, we had already engaged with Force uh, to get started before uh, COVID became real. Um, but, you know, it just absolutely augmented and catapulted how digital healthcare uh, is going to be part of the future, right? And that's that's our better than normal, right? Is using digital tools in a meaningful way, not forgetting about the geographical space, not forgetting about face-to-face -face contact and how important that is. But for pay people who don't have access to care, it can be an amazingly powerful tool. I mean, why should you come limping to the office after a fracture? If all you need is is some questions answered about how you're doing, and 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 that sort of an interaction, um, so digital tools will definitely be more and more part of our future, and they're certainly magnified by the catastrophe uh, of the COVID pandemic. And then how we move forward in terms of okay, when do you see someone face to face? When do you use only digital care? Uh, those are things that have to be worked out. But again, if we manage and monitor that over time, we can start to predict a little bit better who's more likely to need uh, the digital health system and who's not. To Mark's point earlier, you know, there are some people who are just resistant to this. I mean, uh, I'd say more the elderly population over 85 or so is less likely to want to be engaged in this. But I, interestingly, I mean, just two weeks ago, we had a 92 year old patient who was just ecstatic <laughs> about the force program. I saw these videos and, and I'm doing mm. great. And, and like, I don't need to come to your office. You know, I mean, it was just uh, a fantastic thing. And then there are people who overuse it. I mean, frankly, like, you know, I had a ham sandwich today. Is that okay? You know, you get that message. <laughs> um, so, but, <laughs> but, but, but you can, you can still, then you can measure that. Right. So you can say, okay, what, character personalities, what outcome scores, what characteristics are the people who overuse it and, and it's meaningless for, and what are the people that are going to be surprised and engaged? And so that's the ongoing process of learning, right? And so it really gives you a whole learning tool. And, and the COVID pandemic has just, um, you know, made this more obvious to, uh, to us. And just to add to that, you know, on the provider side, I mean, the pandemic really created chaos. And so what you had was a whole slate of May surgeries that had to be canceled. Uh, what are you doing with these patients that are still in pain that can't have an elective surgery because they're not allowed to? Now you're rescheduling these patients from, for June or July and they have to go through a COVID protocol in order to enter the hospital. How do you get that information into their hands? You know, the ability to do that digitally allowed us to partner with Hartford and others and turn this information around in 24 hours. And so that allowed for a seamless relationship with that patient, but they didn't feel like they were abandoned. They were on hold and there were things for them to do during that holding period uh, and then rescheduled. And of course, when they came into the hospital, there was a whole new plan of care. Um, and that COVID information and a video around it was in their new personalized care plan. So uh, it was a way for them to manage through it. And then, you know, the provider or the nurse that is used to talking on the phone, well, if they don't have access to their office because they're working from home, this is the first time we're like, you know, I actually like digital messaging. It's a way for me to systematize a message out to, you know, 20 of my patients all at the same time, communicate back and forth with them. And I don't actually have the ability for them to call me at home. So it kind of showed the value uh, in a way that I think hopefully becomes permanent. That's a great point, Mark. I mean, just think uh, we had a lot of people 
know, suffering from arthritis, where, where surgery was not an emergency, right, but certainly prioritized um, if, uh, and necessary. And now they were able to get onto the force uh, platform in April 2020 and start doing some home care physical therapy exercises without having to go to a physical therapist, which was obviously dangerous at the time, without having to come and see me or my other uh, partners at Orthopedic Associates, uh, Orthopedic Associates of Hartford, to, uh, again, go to, to get evaluated. So they had an online digital platform with recognized videos of this is how you prepare for surgery. And I would actually say that those patients came, by the time we opened up elective surgeries again, they came better prepared than the average patient. Um, and so we're, we're now really, really leveraging that all the time for, for all of our patients. Fantastic. Well, we are nearing the end of our time together today, but before we close out, I just wanted to turn the floor back over to you, John and Mark. Are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with our audience before we close? John, how are you thinking about um, the way that the data you are collecting is going to impact uh, future research? Are we opening up a new error in what you are able to study? Uh, I absolutely think the answer to that is yes. I mean, at, at the Bone and Joint Institute uh, at Hartford HealthCare, I mean, our, one of our uh, wildly important goals, I would call them, uh, would be to integrate research into our clinical daily lives. I mean, it's too often been segregated. Busy private practice and hospital clinicians are often burdened by all that clinical work that they have to do and aren't going to come home at 10 o'clock at night and write a paper. But when we collect data in the way that we're collecting it, leveraged by force, looking at our patient-reported outcomes, and then looking at all the quality metrics that we ought to be doing anyway, then we have um, a, a really powerful data tool upon which we can make important decisions. So I'm asking everybody at the Bone and Joint Institute, whether they're sweeping the floor, cleaning the room, doing physical therapy, rendering nursing care, in the operating room as a technician, to ask, you know, what decisions am I making today? Do I have data uh, to back it up? Why are we doing it this way? How can we always get better? And so all those data tools with force as the background for exactly what's happening to the patient on a day-to-day -day basis integrated into the EMR gives us a really powerful predictive analytic tool for the future uh, and research tools that, that help us to get better every day all the time. And you know, that's, that's what we want. We want tools to keep us smarter all the time. And I think that's what the integration of force and, and our EMR at, at Hartford HealthCare really helps us with. And from your side, Mark, what, what are the challenges from, from the industry side of, you know, you talked about payers and, uh, and data collection tools and the digital space is getting uh, more and more complicated in, in some ways. Are, are there particular uh, forces there or challenges that, uh, that you see for the future? John, thank you for that question. You know, for us, um, we're so confident in our ability to, to be an active part of a, a modernized approach to care. Uh, we want digital technology uh, force and, and all great technologies to be ubiquitous. Um, but in order for that to really happen, I, I do think that the industry needs to continue to evolve. I do think that payers uh, and CMS, uh, you know, need to look at the data and need to discover that this is uh, the future. This should be incented. It should be reimbursed. It should be something that is, in many ways, just a no-brainer. Um, and so that is, you know, that's going to be when, um, you know, the, the floodgates open uh, and we won't even be talking about digital care. It'll just be modern care. Uh, so that's both the challenge and the excitement. And I think, look, you have to stand on your success, uh, just like a great hospital like Hartford, you know, you're as good as the work that you do. And so I do think that that ultimately differentiates us in a market where there are a lot of players. Um, but for the industry, I think this is going to be about the payment models changing 
uh, so that all organizations, uh, you know, think about digital care as a must-have. Thanks so much for your response. John and Mark. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying thanks for to everyone who, who joined in, and I'll, I'll let you finish up, Mackenzie, but it's just been a privilege to be here and to have a conversation. I really appreciate Mark's involvement and, and the opportunity to do this with Beckers. I really appreciate it. Well, thank thanks, you. Thanks, John. We right feel, back at you. You've been a great partner. And we feel so lucky to have you both on for such an informative, great presentation. So thank you again for your time, and thank you to Force Therapeutics for sponsoring today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Otherwise, thank you again all so much for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks.